All right, church, how are you today? All right, it is great to have you here, 8.30, highly caffeinated, ready to rock and roll. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz. On behalf of myself and our leadership team, we just want to thank you so much for being here. You picked a great Sunday to be here. There's so many exciting things that are taking place. Right here at the beginning of our message, though, I want to let you know that one thing that we do as a service just to reach out and serve the greater community of folks, even outside of Wickenburg and outside of these four walls, is we stream live on Facebook, which is on our Facebook page, basically Place AZ, and you can simply get on there and hit share, and you can share this message. In other words, you can send all of your friends right to the front row of the Place Church and let them be part of what God is doing here. Just one easy, simple way that you can spread what God's doing in your heart with your friend list. A great way to use social media for the powers of good. Let me tell you, there's a lot of ways to use it for the powers of evil, but this is a great way for the powers of good. So if you're a Facebooker, click share on there. Let people invite them to church with you for the final message in our sermon series that we've been doing called Sweet Dreams. And what we've been looking at over the last month is simply those things in our life that keep us up at night, the things that steal our peace and stop us from having the full abundant life that Jesus is calling us to have. Tell me something over the course of the last month that stood out for you from this series. Anything. (laughs) One subject that we talked about. Death. Okay, good. So we talked about death and the fear of death. We also talked about regret and how to live in regret. What else? We didn't talk about taxes. That's for next week. (laughs) Can I get one more? Anxiety. Anxiety. Good. I think I heard that from like three people. Anxiety, right? I mean, we, we, we covered these things. And so if you weren't here, maybe you missed it and you think about your life and like, I'm struggling with regret. I'm struggling with anxiety. I have a fear of death. Get on wickenburgchurch.com and you can watch the video from those past weeks. But right now in our culmination message and the message that brings it all together, we're going to be talking about the one common thread, the one link that put all of these things together And it's one word, and that word is fear. Say fear. Fear. And fear is that thing with anxiety and death and regret. That that thread that linked it all together was fear. And so we're going to be looking at fear today. And let me tell you, there's a lot of things out there to fear. Amen? Amen? There's a lot of things even maybe in your life that you fear. In fact, there's even words for things that people fear, right? Uh, Let's just do a little task. I bet you know some of these. You know, for example, the one here, arachnophobia. That's a fear. What is it a fear of? Good, you guys know that. I threw a little softball out there. You see that? That was, that was just easy squeezy. Just, just sent that one right out there. And that's, that's a twisted photo, isn't it? For a guy to start a sermon series. Some of you guys are just... All right, let's try another one. All right, what about this one right here? Claustrophobia. What's that a fear of? Good. Small spaces, right? Being stuck in small spaces. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of harder one now. What about this one here? Agoraphobia. That's the fear of? Fear of crowds. Good. Somebody knew the fear of going out in public, the fear of being out among, you know, when you want to stay home and stay away from people. Agoraphobic. Well, let, let's look at a couple maybe you, you've never heard of before. For example, this one right here. Ergophobia. Ergophobia. Anybody know what this one is? This is actually the fear of work. <laughs> some of you guys have worked with some of these people, right? You, you never put a name to it, but they're ergophobic. They're, you just thought they were lazy. No, 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 no. All right. Let me give you another one. Omphalophobia. Omphalophobia. Any ideas? This is actually the fear of belly buttons. (laughs) Man, it must be tough going to the beach. (laughs) The fear of belly buttons. I I never knew there was such a thing. I mean, there's fear for everything. What about this one? Kynmortophobia. Kynmortophobia. 
Any ideas? This is actually the fear of zombies. I don't know why you have to have a, you know, because if a zombie comes, fear is going to be there. But now you know you're kind more to phobic if uh, you're fearing zombies. But let's bring it really to our lives right where we are. What is something that, that you fear? What's something in your life that's a legitimate right now fear inside of your life? Maybe not belly buttons, maybe not zombies, but what's something you fear? And Say it again. Heights, good, the fear of heights. All right, that's, that's a legitimate fear, yes. Relapsing. relapsing, good. We're on a road of sobriety and we have a fear of relapsing. What else? Failure. Fear of failure, good, fear of failure. What else? Some people have a fear of success. Some people do have a fear of success. You know, we have that fear of failure, but then sometimes a fear of success. If I succeed, people are going to look at me different. I'm going to have more responsibilities. What's my life going to look like? I heard one over here. Fear of? Fear of doing things wrong. Got to add wrong there. Yeah, fear of doing things wrong, making the wrong decision. Can I get one more? Birds, <laughs> all right, birds, or living, or living birds, all right? You don't mind them if they're dead, but if they're alive, that's a problem, all right? Fear, we, we have fear. Now, what you may not know is that fear does affect us, and it affects us in lots of different ways. Sometimes it affects our relationships, but it actually affects us on a physical level. Like, we are physically affected because of fear. In fact, I was recently watching a show called The Doctors. It's a show on TV, and they were talking about this thing called fear. Check it out. Well, one of the things I want to talk about is fear why we feel it, how you can overcome it, because there's something truly happening in our bodies. So I'm gonna head over to the magic wall. And Karen, I understand how afraid of flying you are because that's how afraid I am of snakes. And on this very show, I had to overcome what is essentially a primitive response. We are taught to understand and respond to fear from the time we're infants. We take in external clues. Maybe it's a, something we see, something we hear. We feel fear in our brains, but we're always talking about the mind-body connection. And I'll tell you right now, when you feel fear, something does happen in your body because it sends signals down your spine to these little glands that sit on top of your kidneys. These are called your adrenal glands. What do they secrete? Adrenaline. There's a reason for that because back in the primitive days when a tiger's running after you, you better get that heart beating fast. That's the same feeling I'm sure that you all get when you experience fear. But there is something else going on. With chronic fear, with chronic worry, your brain actually does something else. Your hypothalamus signals your pituitary gland, which then signals your adrenal glands to secrete something else called cortisol. That's why if you have a fear and you never overcome it and you're constantly worried, constantly fearful of this, Cortisol can do a lot of bad things to your body. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause obesity, lead you to type 2 diabetes. All right, stop. All right, we get it. All right, bad stuff happens. I mean, you hear that, like hypertension, stress, stroke, heart attack, you know? I mean, it's all right, doc. Okay, we got it. Fear is not good for us physically, right? So we begin to see that physically fear is not good. Now, in order to talk about this subject scripturally, I actually want us to go to one of the most famous psalms ever talked. In fact, it's a psalm you've probably heard before. I want to go to Psalm 20. Psalm 23. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, open it up. It should be one underneath the seat. For my man in the back, for some reason, my clicker's not working, so click it to the next slide for me. We're going to open up to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, again, is one of the most famous psalms that are out there, and it simply starts with these words right here, the Lord is my shepherd. Have you heard that one before? Yeah, really common if you go to a funeral. This is uh, one that's often talked about, but it's, it's so much greater than just that. It's so much greater than just this last moment in life. I mean, this is a psalm that affects us today, that we can learn from today, that we can apply to our life today. Now, let's start by looking at the first two verses, verses 1 and 2 from Psalm 23. Here's what it says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. 
Now, let's, let's pause right there and really look at it because we see a relationship beginning to be defined, right? We see that the Lord is my shepherd. Well, spoken from that perspective, then if I'm the one speaking, the Lord is my shepherd, that would mean that I am a sheep, I'm a sheep looking to a shepherd, so that begins to define what the relationship is. Now, let me tell you, for a long time in my life, I wanted to be the shepherd. I wanted to call the shots. I wanted to dictate where my life was going and what I was going to do because it's my life and I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm American and that's what we do around here, <laughs> right? It's my way and my will and my ideas and that's just the way it's going to be. Listen, you may be sitting here today and that's the place where you are right now. That's okay. That's okay that you're there right now because probably if I were to push that a little bit in, in your life, you would see that that doesn't work too well. Us calling the shots, us calling the way, us making it just the way that we want it to be. In our, it, eventually, you're gonna get tired. And eventually, that load that you're carrying is gonna get really, really heavy. And eventually, things are going to begin to happen that are beyond you, where you're going to realize that you don't have the answer, and you don't have the knowledge, and you don't have the ability, and you can't fix it if you're a fixer. And in the midst of that moment, that moment of humility, that moment where we get outside of ourselves, we begin to look towards God and say, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I, I need your wisdom. I need your strength. I need the ability that only you can give. And in the midst of that moment, there's a shift and a change in the relationship. There's humility. The Bible says that the pride shall be brought low, right? But the low, the humble, will be exalted and brought up. So we need to humble ourselves and find ourselves in this position where we begin to look towards God as our shepherd. Amen? Amen. And as I read that, it, it really touches one of the fears that I have, one of the fears that makes me want to continue to hold and control my life, and that's the fear of provision. That's the fear that I have that I'm going to be unable to care for my family, take care of myself, take care of those who are looking to me. And maybe you're in that boat too. Maybe you're in a position where you have people looking to you and you have a responsibility to them and that responsibility drives you to be the fixer, drives you to make things happen, drives you to continue to move forward and come up with your own ideas and stand on your own, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just make it. Maybe that fear is driving that. Well, I need you to look at what Psalm 23 said. Did you hear the words? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. And then it says, I shall not want. Now that word in the Hebrew literally means to fail, to want, to lessen, to be abated, to bereave, to decrease. Listen to this. Cause to fail, to have lack, to make lower, or to be in want. See, when we begin to change this relationship, we understand that God is our provider not just ourselves. And that God, when he is my shepherd, says, I shall not be in want. Now, when I first read that, I mean, I have this thought process that just kind of hits me in my brain of, of what that should look like. You know, what this idea would look like. And then I read the next verse and it kind of adds into it where it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now remember, what am I in this story? I am a sheep. And let me tell you, green pastures sound good to a sheep. That's like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? I mean, that is like, you know, you're going to the good buffet, the seafood and, and steak and prime rib. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, what I'm picturing in my mind when, when I'm picturing this, this sheep buffet, right? Just seeing all this, this green grass and just this, all, I mean, you don't even have to move. You know, you just turn your head and you just eat a little bit there and turn your head and you eat a little bit there. I mean, just life is good. This, this is what I'm picturing when I read this. Well, then, then I found this guy who who is teaching more on this 
Like what it meant to David when he wrote it, what, what it meant to a shepherd in the Middle East and what their world was like. And it really allowed my mind to gain a better grasp of what it means to not be in want, to what it means to lie down in green pastures. In fact, I wanted to take you there with me today. Let's, let's go to this green pasture and take a peek at what it looks like in the Middle East. Check this out. Part of a shepherd lesson, I did want to look at one thing in the wilderness that will maybe surprise you a bit. Believe it or not, this is called wilderness, midbar, but it's also called green pastures. Now, when you take a Westerner here the first time and you look at this, you find people say, well, I don't know that I can go there because the Psalm 23, the Lord leads me into green pastures has been pictured as belly deep alfalfa. Well, you haven't seen any belly deep alfalfa. And from biblical time to today, it's rare to see a flock in the farm country. There isn't a lot of farm country in this culture. And so farmers kept the shepherds out as much as they could. Maybe they would come in a little bit after the harvest to glean what was left, but you don't want sheep where you can farm. This is the land of the shepherd. Right on the hillside across from us, you can see those grazing trails cut there by sheep maybe as long ago as Abraham's time. They're spaced so that an animal on one path and an animal on another can reach right to the middle between them. That determines the distance, so you can graze an entire hillside. And the shepherds lead their sheep across that hillside slowly, grazing what's there. Now, you look at it from here and you say, what's there? In fact, I remember my first impression. I woke up one morning, I was sleeping out in the wilderness, and I remember waking up, watching a flock of sheep on a hillside like this, and my, re my feeling was, what are those, rock-eating sheep? I mean, what do they eat? How can you call this green pastures? Well, the answer is, there's a small amount of moisture present here. They get a little bit of rain every year. Not much, but a little. Second, there is humidity in the air, especially in the evening breeze, like right now, you can feel it. Coming from the west off the Mediterranean, there's moisture in the air. That moisture, combination of the rain and the humidity, condenses or drips along the edge of these rocks here. And if you notice, right around the rocks, almost always next to the rocks, you get little tufts of green. Get one a moment. That's what we refer to as the green pastures. So the shepherd looks for a hillside. That's exactly what she was doing. Look at that flock across from us there, just stunning. Those two shepherd girls have found a hillside that either was exposed to the wind or had that small amount of rain. And they move that flock across the hillside and it's one mouthful here, walk a step or two, another mouthful, another mouthful, another mouthful. Now that changes the green pasture image a little bit besides the picture changing radically. Green pastures are not everything you need for the rest of your life. If you make that belly deep alfalfa, then what God is saying, if you follow me, I'm gonna plunk you down and you'll never have to move an inch the rest of your life. Just reach out and grab it. Tell me that your life with God has been like that. Worry, said one rabbi, is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. In the desert, you learn the shepherd will get you what you need for right now. 10 minutes from now, you trust the shepherd. Just enough. Changes the way we look at things, doesn't it? The Lord is my shepherd, leading me exactly to where I need to be to get exactly what I need in order to take the next step. You know, in our lives, a lot of times, we expect to see it all, to see the whole journey, to see everything that there is for us. But see, that's not how the Lord works. The Lord is gonna work in our lives enough to allow us to take the next step and feed us and nourish us and give us what we need. Even think about where your life is right now. Is there any way 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you pictured where you are right now? Probably not. You know, the journey of life, there's a lot of detours. There's a lot of this way and that way. God has a way of getting us to be exactly where we need to be. I gotta tell you, 
10 years ago, 15 years ago, I never even heard of a Wickenburg before. I never even knew this place existed, right? But the Lord knew and the Lord had a plan and my job wasn't to figure it out, God, exactly where do you want me to be? It was just to take the next right step and take the next right step. And we see that in the next uh, verse in the book of Psalms, uh, verse three, where it says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, our lives, it's not about us. It's all about him. Think about that. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. We are following him. So many of us in our life, we think our life is about us. It's not. It's about following after God. It's about saying, God, what do you want from me next? And I just want to be obedient. I want to take that step and I want to follow that path. You know, another fear that drives a lot of the decisions that we make is the fear of being lost. The fear of making the wrong decision. The fear of going the wrong way. And let me tell you, that's understandable fear that we have in our lives. But when we look at scripture and we begin to understand that he has a path for you. He has a path for me. He has a path for us. And our job is to keep our eyes open and to be looking for the path that we have, that he has for us and begin to walk and take the steps that we have to take to get to the place where he is taking us. And really, that's that's incredible because that takes a lot of the weight off. You don't need to know all the answers. You know, Jesus would talk about tomorrow and he says, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. You don't even know what tomorrow's gonna bring. Don't worry about yesterday. We can't go back and change yesterday. We can't change tomorrow. What, do we, what is the only thing we have control over? Our response to today's situation, to the place where we find ourselves today, and the only thing that we can do is we can take the next right step. That's it. See, some of you, you're, you're worried, you're anxious about these things that are a week, a month, a year, 10 years down the line. You can't worry about that. The only thing that you need to do is understand, I just need to take the next right step. Answer that for yourself. Right now, inside of your life, what is the next right step? What is the next right thing for you to do? What is that next door that God has opened that you need to walk through? Or what is that door that you keep banging on that the Lord is an opening that maybe you need to take a step back and you need to go in a different direction? What is that? See, the responsibility that you have in your life is simply to take the next right step. And I don't know about you, but I, I haven't always been that guy. I've been the kind of guy where I want to figure it out and I want to know everything and I want to know every step and everything that we're going to do and I have these big goals. When we first planted the place church, we had a simple goal. Simple goal. We're going to plant 10 churches in 10 years. Yeah, easy, squeezy, right? (laughs) Well, the problem was then we planted one (laughs) and we realized, whoa, this is a lot harder than we thought, you know? And we've learned along the way. But see, if I would have been in a place where I, I would have said, no, this is what we have to do, what would have happened? We would have overstepped. We would have put ourselves in a dangerous place because we weren't ready because, see, the Lord had some lessons to teach us along the way. Your plans that you have for your life aren't bad necessarily, but God has to teach you some things along the way. And you have to be open to some of the lessons that he's teaching you because if he gave you what you desired today without developing your character to the place where you could handle it, you would implode. And not only would you destroy yourself, but you may destroy some other people along the way too. See, the destination really is is the journey. See, I thought the journey was to lead me to the destination, but what I had to realize is that the journey is the destination. This is all we have, this moment. Our response in this moment today on this Sunday is the only thing that matters right now. This is the destination. This is what you're called to with the people that are around you in heaven on earth, Wickenburg, Arizona. In this place right now, this is why you're here on this earth, 
this moment. And when you begin to say, I'm going to be in this moment, I am going to embrace, I'm going to look for the fingerprints of God on where I am right now. When you begin to live that way, let me tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see God all over your life. You're going to see God moving and changing you. You're going to see God working on the inside of you, God developing you. But when you're focused only on something 10 years down the line, you tend to miss what God's doing today. This we need to refocus. He's providing us with what we need in this moment right now to do what needs to be done today. And the last little part is verse four, and this is probably as far as we're going to get today. Verse four of Psalm 23 says this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, I don't know about you, but I, I really get this, this one. This idea of this fearing of evil. And, and maybe I get it because I've, I don't know, I've, I've been there. I, I don't know about you, but... I've been in the place to see firsthand evil. And this idea of even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. For, I mean, I remember a season in my life when I was young and, and I didn't want to continue going. I don't know if anyone here has ever been to the place where your world was so black, where you didn't want to live another day, but it's not a good place to be. We talked about the enemy in John chapter 10, verse 10, where it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that you may have life and have life in abundance. See, I didn't know that. And all I knew was the whispers and the accusations of the enemy in my life just telling me, you're no good. You're never going to amount to anything. And I began to look at the mistakes that I made and the things that I'd done. Just the whispering and the darkness just got worse and worse and worse until it got to the place where I said, I don't even want to continue on. I don't know if you've ever been there, but if you've been there, you know how dark this place is. You know the whispers that I'm talking about. You know the accusations that come in. But see, I, I never knew really about the love of God. I never really knew about the abundant life that God had for me. But I remember in the midst of the darkest moment of my life, something came over me that says, Greg, you're not ready to give up. You're not ready to quit. You're not ready to die. And I remember in that moment, there was a shift. There was a change on the inside of me. And I didn't know all the answers, but for the first time, there was hope. And that hope, no matter how minuscule, how small, changed everything about my life, my entire perspective. You may be in a season right now of extreme darkness. You may be in a season right now of the unknown, not knowing your next step, not knowing where to go, what, what you know, you may fear that you're lost, fear of your provision. You may be in this really dark place right now. And here's what I wanna encourage you to do. Will you just open up to the possibility of hope? See, Jesus came to say, I have another plan for your life. Jesus came to say, I have an abundant life planned for you. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is he doesn't force himself on us. The picture in scripture is that he knocks on the door. The picture in scripture is that he offers. He says, come, follow me. He allows people to make that decision and he comes with hope in his hands looking at you in the midst of your darkness, in the midst of your unknown, in the midst of your fear and says, will you come and will you follow after me? See, when I open my heart just a little bit to the hope that maybe there was a plan for my life, Maybe there was a purpose. Maybe there was something greater for me. And I didn't even have to open it wide. I just, I just kind of cracked my heart a little bit. And I said, you know, maybe this is true. When I just did that, God shone in such a way that he broke through all of the darkness. And if you've ever been in, in a dark place, when light comes into that darkness, no matter how small the light, it's blinding. And I remember this blinding light, hope, was its name, and his name was Jesus for the very first time in my life. And you may look at your life and you understand the fear of evil because I know for some that are out there, you've experienced evil firsthand. Evil has come into your life. Someone has been evil to you or you've been hurt or you have gone through pain. 
And listen, I don't have all the answers for the past, but I do know today that Jesus is there with open arms looking at you and saying, come, follow me. When I look at my life and some of the evil that was done upon me over the years, here's the only thing that God has done, and this is what I share with so many people. I say, God has taken that which the enemy wanted to use to destroy me, and he uses it today for his glory on earth. And I want you to know that he can do the same thing in your life too. When we surrender that pain, surrender that hurt and say, God, will you use this pain? Yeah, I gotta work through it. Yeah, I gotta take steps. I know I got my part. I know I, what I have to do to find healing, to hold on to you. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that story, take what happened in my life, and I'm gonna be an open book, and I'm gonna help others that are there right now, and I'm gonna step in the midst of darkness, and I'm gonna shine light, I'm gonna blind some folks, and they're gonna begin to see life in a different perspective when I begin to use my pain, when I begin to give it over to God and allow him to use it. Does, does that make sense? See, it changes everything. See, the enemy wants to hold that pain on the inside of you and abuse you with that pain continually, attack you. He's the accuser of the brethren. We talked about this in our last message series. But in our lives today, Jesus comes and says, if you'll give that to me, something great's gonna happen. He's gonna heal that area in your life and he's going to allow that to become a voice to help other people too. And we see that through the scripture. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And then the Bible tells us why that we're gonna fear no evil. Because he says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, coming from a shepherd's perspective, and David wrote this psalm, a shepherd's perspective, he understood the role of the shepherd. See, we don't understand that today. We don't understand how profound that is because many of us aren't shepherds. And if you are, hallelujah, you understand me perfectly. Let's talk later about proper shepherd habits. And uh, it'll help me for my next uh, message on shepherding. But if you're not a shepherd, you may not even understand the depth of what this statement is. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, because when the sheep looks to the shepherd, he sees something. And in fact, a shepherd, two things that a shepherd would always have with them whenever they were out there was this idea of, of a rod and a staff. And they had different purposes. So there were different purposes for what they had. So the rod had a purpose. What do you think the rod's purpose was? <laughs> protection. <laughs> so whenever the sheep, you know, some things like sheep, like wolves or lions, you know, uh, over there where, where they would have to use this to protect the sheep. And so whenever anything would come and try to attack the sheep, the shepherd would come with his rod and he would protect the sheep that were there. And so when the sheep looks, it says, I look to my shepherd who has a rod that he is protecting me. He is watching over me. He is keeping me safe. Those that would want to do evil to me, the shepherd will protect me from them. See, that's, that's God in our lives today, that he has a rod and he is our protector. He's watching over us and keeping us safe. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, the other side was the staff. The shepherd's staff, which had a different purpose altogether. In fact, you see the, the shepherd's staff has the round thing on the end, and that was for a purpose. You see, when the sheep would begin to go astray, the shepherd would reach out, put that around the sheep, and bring the sheep back into the fold. Same thing is true with us today. You know, when we find ourselves, we have a shepherd. And when we find ourselves going astray, he, the Lord has a great way of wrapping his little shepherd crook around us and bringing us back. But here's the part I want you to see, and this is what I'm gonna end with. That the shepherd's desire is for the sheep to be close to himself. And I want you to know the same is true in your life today. The Lord is our shepherd. 
The Lord protects us. The Lord keeps us safe. And the Lord brings us into close relationship with him. I don't know where your relationship is with the Lord today. But I want you to know that he's putting his crook around you. That he's drawing you closer. He's letting you know that you're not too far gone. That you're not too far out. That he wants you back in the fold. Back in the relationship with him. And our job is not to fight the shepherd. Our job is simply let the shepherd be the shepherd in our life, to follow him, to trust him, to give our steps over to him and believe that he has our best interest in his mind. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I want to thank you so much for the truth of scripture and for the simplicity of your message. When we look at our lives today, sometimes we want to make things so difficult, so advanced. We, 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 we want to, you know, jump through hoops and do this and do that when simply you're calling us to trust. You're calling us to believe. You're calling us to relax and trust the shepherd. Lord, I believe that you are leading us through green fields. I believe that you're giving us exactly what we need for the next few steps. And Lord, that you know that path for us. God, I just pray that even right now in the midst of this moment, we can let go. We can let go of having to be the one calling the shots. We can let go from trying to have all of the answers. We can let go of trying to make it happen. And we can just believe and trust you for everything. God, in the midst of this moment, I want to be the sheep and I want you to be my shepherd. And Lord, I pray for each and every single person here that they're able to make that transition where they're able to surrender their lives before you, to give everything over to you, to trust you to protect them and to trust you to move inside of their lives, to pull them close, to bring them back into relationship with you, to have your way in them and through them. And maybe you're here today and you've never heard God described like this. But this is who God is. He's reaching out into your world right now. And he's saying you're not forgotten. He's saying you haven't gone too far. He's saying that he brought you here to this place in this moment to hear these words to call you into relationship with him. And if you're in this place and you say, that's exactly where I am and I'm ready to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus. I'm I'm ready to give it all over to the shepherd. I'm ready to follow him wherever he leads me. I'm ready to trust him with my life and my tomorrows and my future. I'm I'm ready to trade in stress for peace. I'm, I'm ready to trade in a heavy heart for a light load and I'm ready to give it all over to God Then I wanna say a prayer with you right where you are. I'm not gonna call you to the front. I'm not gonna embarrass you. This is between you and God right now. But I do wanna say a prayer with you. And so if you're in this place and saying, that's me, I'm ready, God. I'm ready to make a transition. I'm ready to take that step over that line in that sand to give everything over to you. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand up high and we're gonna say a prayer together. So if that's you, if you're ready to say yes to God on the journey that he has for your life, on the count of three, lift your hand up high. Ready? One, two, three. Lift it up high so I can see it. I see you, 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 I see you. I see my hands all over this place saying yes to Jesus. We're gonna pray this prayer with all those that lifted up their hands. And we're gonna, if you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with those that are praying it for the very first time. Say, Jesus, I surrender all to you. I'm on your path for my life. I'm sorry for my past for my mistakes, for my sin. Today, I turn to you and I run to you and I ask for forgiveness. I believe that you lived, that you died, that you rose again and that you haven't forgotten me. Thank you for your grace, for your love and for your forgiveness. Now, I want to pray for you, Father. I pray for each and every single person that lifted their hands and their hearts before you right now. I pray, Lord God, that you fill them in the midst of this moment. This is a defining moment in their life. Their life is never going to be the same after today. That from this moment on, God, I pray that you lead them, that you guide them, that you show them, Father, your fingerprints and your footprints in their life, that they follow the path that you have for them. 
And I, I pray, Lord, that you use their story. I pray that you use what the enemy has used to hold them down, that they surrender that to you, Father. And as they surrender that to you, their story begins to help set people free, that their story begins to point people to you, that their story begins to move in the lives of so many. God, I thank you so much for the work that you're doing in them. And I just pray that every single day, Lord, as they go through this life, that they'll never forget you, that they'll always put you first, that they'll always surrender to your path. And Lord, when they find themselves finding success and moving forward and doors being open, that they always walk forward on their knees in humility and humbleness, understanding that you are the one that brought them there, understanding that without you, God, we're nothing, but with you, we're everything because you are all that was within us. Allow our lives and our breath to bring glory to you on this earth. Thank you, Father, for the work that you're doing in us. And I just pray that you continue to do a work through us. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. amen. Will you guys give it up for the many folks today? That...